Welcome to the Politics of Climate Change. Please welcome Diana Furchgott Roth, Director of the Heritage Foundation Center for Energy, Climate, and Environment. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this session on the politics of climate change. We have two very eminent authors here with us. Uh, we have Jerome Corsi, who's published 25 books on economics, history, and politics, including two number one New York Times bestsellers. In 1972, he received his PhD from the Department of Government at Harvard and his current book, The Truth About Energy, Global Warming, and Climate Change, was just published. Jerome, if you could come up, it would be great. <laughs> we uh, are also honored to have with us Climate Depot publisher Mark Morano, the author of the 2021 book, Green Fraud, Why the Green New Deal is Even Worse Than You Think and the author of the best-selling 2018 book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. He's also the award-winning producer, writer, and host of Climate Hustle, a firm released in 2016 in hundreds of US theaters. His newest book, The Great Reset, Global Elites and the Permanent Lockdown, was published in August 2022. Mark, if you could come up, please, and sit down. Yeah, if you could both sit, take your seats, that would be really terrific. Well, as an economist, the politics of climate change are fascinating to me because as an economist, uh, I know that many of uh, the solutions just uh, don't add up. And for example, the idea that we could have all battery-powered electric vehicles by 2035 and that auto companies are committing themselves not to produce the internal combustion engine at a time when only 5% of Americans are buying these vehicles is very surprising to me as an economist. Also, the idea that certain vehicles and certain forms of technology are emissions-free because they run on batteries, when these emissions have to be produced somewhere through electricity. Uh, that's also very surprising. Right now, with the technology available and the technology in sight in the future, uh, these policy objectives uh, just do not add up. Uh, in addition, we have many, many millions of people who are below the poverty line in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, who can only be given the advantages of Western electricity, Western water through uh, conventional fuels. There is no way that solar and wind will be able to lift these individuals up to the standards that we have in the West. And if you've ever lived without running water, if you've ever lived without electricity, uh, you know that the availability of electricity and running water is just central to uh, health, uh, to the safety of your family, uh, to human flourishing, to potential development. So unless we move to a situation where we have massive investment in nuclear energy, which is a dense emission-free energy, we're not going to be able to accomplish the goals of zero emissions. But proponents of battery electric vehicles and other environmental measures are also against nuclear energy. So this is not as much an economics question as a political question. And that's why we are so glad to have these two authors with us today. And in addition, they're going to be able to take your questions. So we're going to open with 10 minutes from each of them discussing their book. Then we're going to have a discussion. 
Uh, and we're also going to move to audience questions from those who are watching us online, who are very, very welcome, and we're happy that you are watching today. Why don't we start with Jerome? And you, you can speak me? from here if you like, oh, because be you're great. mic'd. Sure. That's better. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my book uh, is I, it's like one of the more comprehensive books I've written. It's uh, titled The Truth About Energy, Global Warming, and Climate Change. And I put there the truth for very particular reasons. And the subtitle is Exposing Climate Lies in the age of disinformation. Now, uh, in the short introduction, I'm just going to touch on some of the points of the book. Number one, uh, I go through the history of how this movement developed, beginning after World War II. And there were various authors like Harrison Brown, who was a very eminent scientist, who was writing in the 50s about scarcity, running out of things. And he was basically concerned there were too many people. He's one of the first to advocate birth control to reduce people, even government imposition of limits on children. He, dr he dramatically wanted to reduce the world's population. And that was followed by uh, people like Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb in 1968, I believe. And it was, again, a best-selling book. Too many people were going to run out of the Earth's resources. It was Malthusian. Uh, this idea got co-opted when John Holdren, who was Obama's science czar, joined with, together with Ehrlich, and they began moving it in a climate direction. Holdren was a scientist. They decided if they could demonize something about the climate, get an existential risk, we're all going to die unless we do this, we're all going to die if there's too many people, then the idea was that they could demonize carbon dioxide and say it's going to cause dramatic changes in the climate. Uh, since hydrocarbon fuels emit carbon dioxide, you would get rid of hydrocarbon fuels, and that would destroy capitalism. So suddenly the movement became a neo-Marxist movement, and it still retained the depopulation aspect to it. Now, when you get full range here and you see Green New Deal, it's become fully neo-Marxist, and the goal to eliminate capitalism and to take on the entire woke agenda has become part of the climate movement. Now, the second part of my book shows that the science does not support the idea that hydrocarbon fuels are detrimental for a number of reasons. Hydro, uh, the carbon dioxide is a trace molecule, 0.04% of the atmosphere. Water vapor is about 70% of all greenhouse gases, far more potent than carbon dioxide. We had much more carbon dioxide in the early Earth. And it's only now, it's gone from several thousand parts per million in the atmosphere down to, beginning of the Industrial Age, 200 parts per million. Today, about 400 parts per million. That's doubling, but it's very minimal. And the energy coefficients of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas in that small proportion are not sufficient to produce the changes that are being forecast in climate change movement to destroy us all. There's a couple other really important parts of the book. I'm going to try to just hit highlights. I demonstrate that there is no such thing as fossil fuel. No fossil ever made a fuel. No, no living tissue dies and advances to a higher form of energy that would violate the second law of thermodynamics. We die. We're going to decompose. We get buried because we're going to smell. They don't line the casket, say this Aunt Matilda is going to turn into oil. Never happens. We deteriorate. What happens is the, during World War II, before World War II, the Germans knew they had a lot of coal. They didn't have oil. They decided for their chemists in the Weimar Republic actually figured out how to synthesize oil. They figured out the equations that make hydrocarbon chains combine. And these equations are operative in the mantle of the Earth. The Earth exudes hydrocarbon fuels from deep de depths. You can see them coming out in the ocean vents at the bottom of the sea, where there's no light, and the creatures live on the hydrocarbons coming out of the center of the Earth. 
The last point I want to make is this. Changes in the Earth when they occur are dramatic. So we've had five major extinctions. 80% of Earth's history, 4.6 billion years, there was no life on the surface of the planet at all. It's all in the last 20% of Earth's history. In that time, there's been five major extinctions where virtually everything living died. They're all basically cataclysmic events. 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs disappeared, the dinosaurs um, had a massive, a massive asteroid hit the Yucatan, fractured it, sent tsunamis all the way up to North Dakota. There was a thousand years of volcanic activity in India through sulfur oxide in the atmosphere, blocked the sun, to, that was photosynthesis was gone, the dinosaurs ate plants, and the Earth expanded. It's expanding Earth theory. Dinosaurs were too big to exist in a more intense gravitational field, more gravity. So the idea that we're going to extinguish ourselves by using hydrocarbon fuels is uh, ridiculous. The third part of my book deals with the economics. I'm going to leave that for the discussion because we've already covered that. You covered the economics very well, and I will cover it. But I agree entirely. Uh, the, these other technologies are not strong enough. I'll make one point. If you had a battery the size of a flashlight battery that could get enough solar energy in it to light up a city, you wouldn't have to have government programs subsidizing it. Private industry would produce that immediately. The technology of renewable fuels, yes, you can put a solar panel on your house and get some electricity, but they are not scalable and they are not sufficiently robust to handle a sizable population and the the climate change, global warming movement knows it. Because remember, as I said in the beginning, it's a depopulation movement as much as anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mark, how about you? Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Dana, for this. Uh, the first book, I, the, this was my second book, with Green Fraud, Why the Green New Deal Was Worse, came out in 2021. And when I started writing this, when the Green New Deal first came on the stage, I was telling everyone, you know, this is going to be the biggest you know, legislative battle in the history of, the, of America, one of the biggest battles. There's going to be a huge congressional fight. There's going to be an election issue. And what happened was, and as I was finishing the book and getting to the end, March 2020 happened. And that literally changed the entire climate debate, probably permanently, or at least in the, you know, for a decade to come. Because prior to that, there had been indications the debate was moving to what I would call the Chinification of America, or the uh, idea of no longer putting this up for a vote. Because if you go back, and I detail in the book, uh, back in 2009, when President Obama had super majorities in the House and Senate, he tried to get a cap and trade bill passed, uh, the climate bill, and essentially it failed on the first vote, if I'm not mistaken, with Nancy Pelosi, and then they did a whole bunch of bribes and forced and they twisted people like uh, House Agricultural Committee Chairman uh, Colin Ferguson from Minnesota, forced them, to, turned them around, all the pork, what you'd expect a House Speaker to do to get people to come in line. It passes the House, and that was, I think, June of 2009. Well, a lot of time passes. In 2010 rolls around, Harry Reid announces, then Democrat Majority Leader, that they weren't going to even put the cap and trade bill to a vote. And that's important to mention because at that point they failed and with their climate agenda in the Obama administration legislatively. So what the Obama administration tried to do, and it was a sort of a forerunner of what happened under COVID, they decided to do executive orders. They decided to bypass democracy. I actually was talking about the Chinification, the idea of one party rule, authoritarian rule in China was literally praised by many on the left. UN climate uh, chief U Christina Figueres, including Tom Friedman, the New York Times, saying that you know they could impose what's necessary in a country without the messiness and hassle of democracy. Justin Trudeau actually has said uh, that you know, this is a, uh, a basic great admiration for China's basic dictatorship, especially when it comes to things like climate. So Obama moved us in that direction. Then of course Trump came and blew up their whole agenda. But Biden came in, and the reason Biden was able to do this, there was Green New Deal was introduced in Congress, never scheduled for a vote, no hearings, no town halls, no constituent meetings, 
nothing. Why is that? Well, everything changed in the whole climate debate in March 2020, which is where the Great Reset book comes in. And actually, I have a whole chapter devoted to that in this book, basically foreshadowing this book, saying this has changed the whole climate debate. We're no longer dealing with uh, anyone talking about uh, you know, we had to get this legislation passed and let's get lobbyists on this and let's get hearings and we had, none of it matters. Here's why. In March of 2020, when they did the COVID National uh, Emergency Declaration, with also the two weeks to flatten the curve, uh, 15 days to slow the spread, that changed American politics forever. Uh, because every governor and mayor became overnight a dictator. They could determine without anyone voting on it, without legislators, supervisors, town halls, parliaments uh, globally, they could determine that churches would be closed, schools would be closed, restaurants would be closed. Uh, you could have stay-at-home orders, curfews, weddings, funerals. But hey, Walmart was open. And you know, big tech, the biggest transfer of wealth from poor middle class to the wealthy. This, first of all, shocked the climate activists. And we had so many people come out, I can't believe they're doing this. Why didn't we do this for climate? And then the climate activists, and I detail this with gr in great detail in The Great Reset, and, and, I, and a little bit in Green Fraud on the COVID aspect, but they started coming out. Uh, it was uh, Jamie Margolin, uh, Margolis from Teen Vogue said, if we can shut down the world for a virus, we can do the same for climate. John Kerry came out and said, the parallels between COVID and climate are screaming at us. Jane Fonda, the Green New Deal activist, who I interviewed here at the Capitol for a Green New Deal protest, actually said, COVID is God's gift to the left. And it truly was, because this allowed them, they didn't need any more stinking democracy. And that's really, people say, what is the Great Reset? Well, it's the World Economic Forum capitalizing on the crisis of COVID to basically say, we don't need democracy anymore. We're going to follow a Chinese rule. So by these emergency declarations, they got to achieve everything they wanted with an iron fist. Now, people say, oh, well, you have the court system that coming. Yeah, and the courts did. The CDC had this, um, actually it was the CDC, but the Department of Transportation had the, the mask mandate. It took two years for one Donald Trump appointed federal judge to overturn these mask mandates. And that's how long the courts take. And then of course the mask mandates went away because they were unconstitutional, but the CDC was able to go after renters. So what happened here was the climate people got immediately on the, and immediately we saw studies. First of all, two, two parts to this, linking COVID and climate. So we had the Harvard School of Medicine, you had the journal Nature, all saying unchecked climate change is going to lead to, to much worse COVID and viruses like it. So in other words, if you didn't support the Green New Deal or the UN Paris Agreement, you were now a grandma killer because this was gonna create all new virulent forms of COVID. And they love that angle. The next thing that happened, and this has infected the International Energy Agency, this has infected British Medical Journal, this has infected New England Journal of Medicine, this has infected the journal Cell, which published Anthony Fauci. They're all basically saying that we need the response to COVID, the same response, the using, uh, response to climate using the same template as COVID. And so what they're doing is they're, and this is according to the Associated Press, Washington Post from July article, Joe Biden is set to declare a national climate emergency. This has groups like the Center for Biological Diversity very excited. They're already touting 130 new wartime presidential powers that Biden will have, presumably to extend to mayors and governors. We know from the International Energy Agency report of a few months ago that we know the blueprint for what you could call an energy lockdown. They're talking about car-free cities, odd even days, gas stations open rotating days, they're talking about more thermostat controls, which we just saw in August in uh, utility companies doing it under an energy emergency in, in Colorado for their residents. They're talking about essentially prescribed blackouts. They're talking about under a climate emergency, limiting airline travel. The Washington Post just had an article detailing how the, uh, the, the, there's a new report out. They're touting a global tax on airlines. The more you fly, and it gets pretty heavy. Some flights can be up to almost $200 tax if you've flown enough going after business travels. Oddly enough, the same study did not look at uh, banning private jet travel. It was only commercial jet travel. So this, it's about our freedom of movement they're going after. So to, to wrap this all up, everything that has upset anyone, I would say, and that's particularly left of center, 
and many liberals, and I have a whole chapter devoted to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who actually said, when I interviewed him at the New York City Climate March, climate deniers and the CEOs of these companies belong in jail at The Hague with all the other war criminals. And, and in this book, I issue a formal forgiveness for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. because of his stance against lockdowns, mask mandates, and recognizing the, essentially the global plan to take away our freedom. But also there's Naomi Wolf, the former Clinton Gore advisor. Hollywood socialist Russell Brand is my new hero. If you watch his YouTube channel, it, it'll blow you away how he's almost pro-Trump at this point, the way he talks. Jimmy Dore used to be on Young Turks, so I, I detail that. But essentially what's happened in the last two and a half years is everything that's happened from vax mandates, mask mandates, lockdowns, uh, yeah, the, the restricting of meat, even the, even the blackouts and electric car, uh, gas-powered car bans has done without a vote of democracy. In other words, everything is just being imposed upon us through corporate government collusion. I like to say big tech censorship is government censorship. When you see the Biden White House give a list of names of who they should release, we see this through Freedom of Information. Big tech comes back, yes, we're working on it. How about this website? We're on it. We're going to take that down. So this kind of corporate, we saw it happen at the Freedom Convoy in Canada as well. When you had the Freedom Truckers protesting the vaccine mandates, Justin Trudeau declared them terrorists, essentially domestic terrorists, and their bank accounts were cut off, the insurance for their trucks were cut off, the government just declared it, and corporations were more than willing to collude with government on that. Same thing is happening, uh, it, you know, we had the Department of Justice try to declare the parents who protested at school boards the same concept. So, in other words, what they've done in the last couple of years, without a vote, no one voted for this, they've collapsed our energy. Well, I guess you could say they, they, we voted in ways for, for politicians who were promising, they were never promising to collapse energy, they were promising a green utopia, but they've collapsed our energy, our food supply, They've gone after meat eating. They're going after high yield agriculture with net zero. With, make no mistake, the Netherlands is a target for net zero agenda because it's the number one meat exporter in Europe. And their stated goal is to go after meat eating, make it a rare and expensive treat. Uh, and this is by the United Nations, by the uh, World Economic Forum. And then they've also gone after uh, transportation. And classic example is Governor Newsom issues an executive order, the California Air Resources Board follows up with an unaccountable bureaucratic board with a timetable to ban the gas-powered cars. 17 states, including my home state of Virginia, have trigger laws to go along with it. Pete Buttigieg, our energy secretary, all excited, want to make it national. The World Bank, former president Nicholas Stern, at a World Bank meeting, actually said we need to come up with a timetable to end financing for the internal combustion engine, which means what? Which means they're going to make automakers stop being able to finance it. Uh, banks in Australia are basically saying that they can no longer provide car loans to anyone who wants to buy a gas-powered car. So everything I just mentioned was done without debate, hearings, legislator, parliament, and that's the new normal. That's the great reset. It's the Chinification of America, the once free West emulating one party Chinese rule, and climate is their center of attention now. And that's what this book presents. World Economic Forum, World Health Organization has now declared climate the number one public health threat of the 21st century. So this is where it's moving to, and it's a combination of COVID and climate. They're fusing the two together. Well, so with uh, that, you thank can, you very much. And we need to be yeah. fortunate, we should be fortunate <laughs> that uh, we are not uh, citizens of China because they have been locked down in case, yes. some cases for months at a time. Uh, the government trying to see how far it can go without civil unrest in terms of locking people in their homes. Okay, I, I, well, um, I dedicated this book to Mark Morano. Yes, it is. And Mark and I have worked together for a long time. And uh, he's been, I, I've attended climate meetings with him. He's gotten thrown out of more climate meetings than I've attended. <laughs> Could you put it my was, book up there, please? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. It was, uh, well, I'd like, like to, we I'd had like a cardboard to... cutout of Trump at the UN meeting, and they uh, literally had armed climate cops to score us out. But yeah, but and I just want to say, Mark has been a champion of this movement. He's, I've written many books on many different subjects. Mark has lived this with a dedicated effort, and he's to be applauded for having brought this message forward. I have always supported Mark's work. We work very closely yes, together, yeah. and I'm honored to be here today with him. And I well, I'm you. honored to be Thank here you. with both of you. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you uh, uh, a question that, as an economist, has really puzzled me. Here we are coming down to the midterm elections. 
oil prices are going up. The United States has 373 billion barrels of oil, which is a 50-year supply. We have 3,000 trillion cubic feet of gas, natural gas, a 100-year supply. Yet President Biden wants to make deals with Venezuela for them to produce oil. And Venezuela, of course, is linked to Russia and China. Uh, President Biden is begging the Saudis uh, to increase their oil production. Why is he doing that? Why couldn't we just be producing more here? Wouldn't that be easier for him politically? Because then right away, based on expectations of future production, prices would go down and he would have an easier time cruising into these November elections. Well, uh, well I'll just say real quick, I think uh, his energy secretary, Granholm, said it best. It's, they want oil in the short term, but five to 10 years, they want it to start going down. So they know intuitively that they can't get permits, drilling, companies aren't gonna get investors. So where are they gonna go? They gotta go outside the country to get an increase. And he's drained the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to a 40 plus year low, basically to save Democrats in the midterm election. I didn't know that was part of our strategic plan to use it for elections, but he is. So I'll, I'll let Jerry come. Well, I mean, first of all, the first recognition is that Oil and natural gas are so abundant, I cannot imagine we'll ever run out. Now, that doesn't mean they're infinite. It means that they're not finite. By the time we will be having a new energy source, just like coal is no longer used the way it was in the 1850s, we have so much coal we wouldn't know what to do with it. It's an no enormous amount of coal all over the world, and we're not using it. The second part is that the, the politics of this are to negate the economics. In other words, we could have abundant energy and we could be a world leader. Donald Trump proved that. It could be cheap. And our modern industrial societies run on cheap energy. Populations which have grown to the billions they are today wouldn't be here without cheap energy. And that should be, what we should be endeavoring to do is to spread this to the part of the world that is underserved with energy. Instead, these, uh, it, it's almost like a, uh, I consider it to be almost, you know, satanic in the way it's going on. The, the whole Marxist orientation, which started out as a hate God movement, Marx was not an atheist, he hated God. He had to exist for Marx to hate him. And the point is that when you look at destruction of people, you say there's too many people, we're running out of resources, Malthusian thinking, it always goes into political control, totalitarianism. It's combined, my first, this is my first book of a three book series called The Great Awakening Trilogy. The second book will be on the neo-Marxism, the cultural Maoism, and the anarchy on the social justice lies. And they go together because this is a byproduct of this entire ideological shift which is going on to a neo-Marxism and it's taken over the country, it's taken over the world without people being aware of the political roots from which it came. I go back to Kant, I go back to Hegel, and show you the Frankfurt School in the second book. And it's just about finished, I'll have it done at the end of this month. And it will demonstrate that we are not only in a, a period of time which makes no sense rationally from energy economics, it makes no sense in terms of all the history and tradition of liberty and freedom, and the idea is to negate liberty and freedom, to destroy capitalism, to destroy the standard of living we have in the world. Uh, and that's why you're going to find that energy today, when you look back at this, if these peoples continue to succeed, these high prices we're having today will be considered cheap because their intent is to make energy unaffordable. And in Europe right now, they're experiencing that because without Russian gas, natural gas, many in Europe are gonna freeze this winter. Their Germans are cutting down forests for firewood. The Poles are coming to coal stations and asking to have enough coal to get through the winter. Their people are burning garbage to keep warm. Their people are storing all kinds of things, knowing that they're gonna freeze. This is a bad winter. Millions will die with this policy and the globalists will not be concerned because it's actually uh, within the re-engineering of a free society into a totalitarian society, the, the Chinaization, as, as it were, of America. 
So that's the, that's the little bit longer answer to the question. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, Paxton here has a mic. Uh, so let's go to you. Uh, let, let's go to David Burton here. And then afterwards, we're going to go to Myron Ebel over here. David Burton, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, natural gas and petroleum are feedstocks for fertilizer. And fertilizer is uh, a vital element to having productive agriculture. So it strikes me that in the developing world, the left's policies and their attacks on fertilizer uh, or, uh, will result in tens of millions and potentially more deaths as a result of famine and r radical price increases in the rest of the world. I was wondering if you have done some work or are familiar with work seeking to quantify how many millions of people will die because of these left-wing policies. Why, you want to take it first? Well, I, yeah, I don't have an actual number on that, although I know that even things like the UN Food Organization is warning about and showing an increase, not only from the result of the lockdowns, but just this food scarcity, which they're not really attributing a cause to. As I mentioned earlier, one of the causes is this net zero goal of going against nitrogen fertilizer, which creates nitrogen oxide, which they're claiming is one of the most dangerous, potent greenhouse gases. The problem with that is they're not only going now after CO2, which one of these UK government reports actually said will regulate carbon dioxide, which humans exhale, as asbestos. But now, it was just, this was in Scientific American, the nitrogen fertilizer and the fact that we're eating all this meat is essentially they're saying that's the meat eating is creating a human pee problem that's essentially our pee now is polluting urine is supposed to be polluting creating more nitrous oxide creating more dangerous warming so it's an anti-human agenda at its core and when you look at this uh, especially in the developing world i mean they need again cheap available food but the irony of all this is going to be they predicted for decades climate activists that food shortages would be coming due to man-made global warming if left unchecked their policies are now creating food shortages, which they will then blame on man-made global warming and get, therefore push for more of the same policies creating the food shortage. It's a vicious, sick cycle. And that's why, you know, in the book, I argue we, just, we need to stand up against the entire narratives and push back on every single one of these, whether it's the, the food destruction, the car destruction, the energy destruction, our free speech destruction. It's all related. The UN announced they own the science. I mean, every aspect of this, but if you want to comment on food. Yeah, it just a very, uh, first of all, we exhale carbon dioxide. And so therefore, the, the movement is suicidal in nature. We are the enemy. Human beings are the next extinction. We're going to cause our own extinction. Okay, so they've picked something that is inherently self-loathing on human beings. Paul Ehrlich got his degree studying butterflies. He wrote constantly, there were too many people. He never wrote anything to too many butterflies. <laughs> the point is, secondly, that when you look at carbon dioxide in terms of what its impact is, it's extremely small. There is no global warming going on. This hockey puck, this hockey stick, you know, hockey stick Michael Mann came up with saying that all the temperatures were just fine until the industrial age, and then suddenly it got warmer. Even from the climate gate emails we have, we know that data was rigged and they knew it. The, the secret of this is that the global warming community and the IPCC knows their science is fraudulent. They know that it is completely distorted. Uh, and for instance, the last point I want to make on this, it, it, I agree with Mark, we've got to fight the fundamental premises. I just wrote an article in American Thinker on this hurricane that just occurred in, in Florida, because again, Michael Mann was out there saying, this is climate change, global warming. Well, in fact, even on the NOAA website, this is our you know, astronomical, basically measuring all the weather, meteorologist has a long article, It'll probably be taken down after I wrote about it. I made sure to capture it so I have it proof. What he wrote is that there is no proof, there is no evidence which would link hurricanes with carbon dioxide. The, the argument is just, just not enough of it. And it, 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 the power is not sufficient. The last point I want to make is people need to understand that the function of the Earth's weather is to distribute heat. The nature of the Earth's tilt, the sun hits us at the equator. And so the Earth is blessed with this atmosphere in which we can distribute the heat 
from the equator to the poles and from the lower atmosphere to the upper atmosphere. That keeps the planet livable because it regulates the heat to the extent that we can. Now we have ice ages, that's still functioning, but the planet can't overcome the amount of cold we're getting at that time. And ice ages tend to occur because of the elliptical orbit of the Earth. When it's the most elliptical, or the most far from the sun at the extreme, that's when we get ice ages. And another one will occur. We're right now in an interglacial warming period. We should be thankful we are. Life prospers in these periods of time. But the point is, these changes that occur on Earth, including hurricanes, including all the storms, now they're climate change because they know global warming can't be proved. So they want to attribute every storm's happened. Every storm is now a result of climate change. The Earth needs these dramatic events in order to help regulate the heat. The ocean currents are much more responsible for hurricanes than uh, carbon dioxide. It's completely a lie. I just want to add that meteorologist Joe Bastardi had a great phrase. It's the weaponization of the weather, and this is nothing short of climate ambulance chasing where every flood, hurricane, tornado, drought, wildfire is somehow proof of global warming. Michael Manns has actually said, if you want to see how global warming is doing, look outside your kitchen window. Right. Like they want, so that's, and it's a lobbying effort to get people to support and, you know, and United many, Nations. Exactly. And, I actually, and I actually have some data on these hurricanes just here. Please, well, many young people today are panicked because they don't think they'll have a future. They've heard this narrative, yeah. and they say, Mommy, Daddy, you're going to kill me because you're putting that evil gasoline in your car. This whole thing is a brainwashing exercise, and it is not founded on, on solid science. I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. No, no, no. no, no. It, you, you're absolutely right about the hurricanes from the 1870s through the 1950s. There was an average of 6.3 category 3, 4, or 5 hurricanes that made landfall each decade. From the 1960s through the 2010s, the average was 5.6. And the 11-year period from 2006 through 2016 was the longest period in meteorological history when no Category 3 or higher storms hit the United States. <clears throat> but I wanted to ask you uh, why, um, given that uh, these proponents of global warming and climate change think emissions, including carbon dioxide, are the problem. Why are they not more enthusiastic about nuclear power? Because nuclear power is energy dense, it's emissions free. There are small modular reactors that could be sent to uh, small communities in Africa and Asia that would power those villages so they didn't have to use coal. Uh, why is it that there, are, there is not more of a movement in favor of nuclear power? This seems to be a political rather than an economic question. I'd well, be very Marshall, interested to first. Ask. I would say there, there is a movement among certain environmentalists, people like Michael Schellenberger, the Times Hero of the Environment, who's actually apologized for his role in the climate scare, details a lot of this. But I think the ultimate answer to your question, without getting into nuclear energy, really, is they don't really want plentiful energy for the human race. Their vision is one of austerity, one of limits. Uh, if you, uh, AOC did a video a few years ago about a vision of the, of the Green New Deal, and it was all about people living in a city where everything was like in perfect harmony. And this is the World Economic Forum's vision of you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Everything you want will be delivered by drone. You won't even own your apartment because it'll be sublet out to business. You won't need to own an appliance like an egg beater because you could order one and it'll be delivered to you. Uh, you'll rent it for a few hours. They have this vision of such a mastermind control that people don't need space, prosperity, they don't need wealth creation. In fact, the UN actually has said during, in the Vancouver Declaration, wealth creation creates uh, inequity and, and uh, concentration of wealth. They're against people owning property. So in that guise, they don't really look at nuclear as necessary because they see a much more primitive global population once their policies are implemented. But, that's if, why. but if drones are delivering goods, then those drones are going to need to be recharged that's with right. electricity <laughs> from somewhere. And I assume that these apartments are air conditioned and heated. It's like a movie. They'll come up with some new technology that makes, they'll be able to make synthetic it's batteries. Never meant to, <laughs> it's never meant to be make it, it makes sense. <laughs> uh, that's the fun. We've got to understand that. The, the um, whole thing with nuclear energy 
it illustrates what is done by this far left hate, hate people crowd, is that you fundamentally look at a Chernobyl or Three Mile Island and you demonize it. You, may, you say, this is what nuclear power does. If we have nuclear power, we're all going to die because we can't make it work. The US Navy runs on nuclear power, and I don't recall we have a lot of problems with it. It can be done. Well, France, 70% of French electricity comes yeah, from nuclear power. used to, until they decided they were going to reduce it. Germany's just gone back to turn on some of its nuclear power plants. They hope it was a move in, in Europe to shut down nuclear power. Uh, the, the point is, again, that Nuclear power is, as I said earlier, a new form of energy. And, and fission and fusion, these are future forms of energy. We'll have abundant hydrocarbons in part because we won't need them. You'll have a nuclear or some form of battery that's powered in a nuclear fusion or fission that is enough to, you know, a battery will power your car. We'll have, we'll have atomic batteries in our cars. That's possible. You have atomic batteries running community, you have a little nuclear plants running communities. These things are feasible, but the point at soon will be even more feasible. But the, the point, you run a ship on one nuclear reactor in that ship, okay? So it can be done. But the point is, that's not the purpose. The purpose here is one of um, uh, oligarchy, small group, together with their friends in multinational corporations ruling the world. Now, when they destroy all the people, I don't know who they're going to sell their goods to. But again, <laughs> these things are not necessarily well thought out. Right. And they don't necessarily, they never make sense. Yeah. Myron, you had a, a question. Thank you. Uh, a comment uh, and then a question. Uh, my comment is, in fact, this is the age Let's of coal. Let's make it a short, a short comment. Yes, this is the age of coal. Coal. Uh, consumption this year, according to the IEA, will set an all-time record globally. Uh, my question is, uh, Mark, I take your point that uh, the, the uh, politicos have moved from legislation to executive fiat. An emergency power. Yeah. An emergency power. But the Congress did pass the Inflation Reduction Act, so-called. And I'd like to ask you what you think is going to happen because there's this guy named John Podesta who's been in, put in charge of doling out the money. Now, uh, the, the word corruption comes to my mind, <laughs> and I wonder whether you think the corruption that's going to follow is really a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> well, I don't know how to answer. I, I mean, corruption is generally regarded as bad. The Inflation Reduction Act was basically a partisan line vote, a sort of a party loyalty test. And it was very focused on climate. It's funny, all these Democratic congressmen come out and admit it. Nothing to do with inflation. They just called it that because that's what they wanted to call it so it wouldn't be called a climate bill. But two serious analysis of that was Bjorn Lomberg, Roger Pilkey Jr., two separate analysis. It wouldn't even affect global CO2 level, essentially, let alone potentially the climate in any way, shape, or form. It's one of the biggest pork barrel spending. Bill Gates personally lobbied. Um, for this bill, calling up Joe Manchin, and then it turns out Bill Gates as has, has enterprises will be benefiting, I, I want to say it was more than a half, hundreds of, hundreds of millions or something, just to go into a few Bill Gates enterprises. So I expect a lot of corruption in this. Uh, but you know, corruption in Washington never really phased me. I, I always said spending. I long ago quit caring about how much they spend, even Republicans who push things like carbon capture and all that. I'm not going to really fight that in the sense that it's, I think it's a boondoggle, a waste of money. Maybe research into that for the future, but they keep pouring money into especially renewables. I don't, th that stuff you're going to expect out of Washington. That's expected corruption. But what's really changed, and my point with the last two and a half years, is they are now able to just dictate things which previously was unthinkable. Uh, and that's where the COVID emergency powers open up their eyes. And I think that's where Biden's coming with, with the climate emergency powers. And you actually have publications like the UK Guardian saying, we need a global lockdown every two years in order to meet the US Paris climate goals. So in a way, I guess, it's better to give them huge pork barrel spending with the usual corruption than, than the other direction, which is you know, emergency power and dictates and, and collusion between corporate government entities. That's good old-fashioned corruption. I actually welcome that, if that's, your, if that's the answer to your question. The Inflation Reduction Act is not as worrying as all the other aspects of this. Uh, I read a chapter on the Solyndra. It says the redox, redo of Solyndra. Mm -hmm. If you remember, Obama spent billions of dollars on green energy out, out of the 
of the right. Stimulus Act. Uh, Falindra was a battery factory that went out of business and received large amounts of government yeah, yeah. funding. And there was, in fact, the, uh, the billions that came out of the Recovery Act that Obama passed right after the real estate crash, uh, much of that money went to the cronies and the friends. Uh, in fact, I, there were studies done, 80% of the money went to the people on Obama's 2008 Finance Committee, 80% of the money spent in Solyndra in that era. Virtually all the projects failed, went bankrupt. This little, I detailed the projects that failed, solar, wind, uh, solar and wind will largely end up junk. They're going to be out there spinning around. Nobody's going to want them if they were halfway sensible. And the, all these projects built huge fields of solar panels. They had huge fields of wind turbines. They failed economically. The people kept the money, these Obama cronies, and the projects are gone. No one went to jail. No one was prosecuted for this. And when you put John Podesta in charge of the money, you know, one of my top climate scientists, John Podesta, who, uh, if, you, if anyone read the Assange release of emails from Podesta, you'll know what kind of an operative he is. I can guarantee you that money is going to go to friends of John Podesta. Well, and for example, the White House rolled out plans for charging stations in the different states. And Alaska, Minnesota, they have many charging stations. but. As anybody knows, these are very, very cold places, and battery, uh, the batteries just run down to zero in those areas. There's a reason people in Alaska don't have battery-powered electric vehicles. And even internal combustion engines, when you pull up to a grocery store, there's places to keep them heated, yeah, right. because those engines f freeze. So. Right, so I think that you're seeing an, a repeat of the boondoggle on renewable projects. And the narrative is we're glad hydrocarbon fuels, gasoline costs more because it will speed the movement to these renewable fuels, wind and solar. Obama tried the same thing. You could speed their implementation all you want. They don't work. OK, another uh, question over here. And then we had a question over here. They don't Thank work you. on a scalable basis. They don't work uh, in the magnitude you need them. They're not sufficiently powerful. You, know, you can get a wind turbine, it'll generate electricity. But to generate enough electricity to power Los Angeles or New York, how much territory are you going to put into wind turbines and how much territory are you going to put into solar panels? And is, are, is that going to work at that scale? Right, and to transmit the energy also transmit to those places it. from where it's being produced. Right. Now, question over here, and then we had a question from you. Yes. So the, this discussion dovetails something, my own question, and that is, politicians act in their own political self-interest, which isn't necessarily a you know, bad thing always, but somebody's funding them. They're, they're clearly pursuing this insanity, this agenda. I mean, the there may be more of an effort to dictate and bypass Congress, but there's lots of people in Congress that are perfectly happy with that. So, but they're getting funding. They're you know, it's in their political interest to do this sort of thing. And so, what? Who, who would you say are key donors of it? I mean, there's, this is being supported financially, because absent that, they wouldn't be relentless about it, because they're all about getting reelected and increasing their power. But somebody's behind this. Many people are behind this. And, well, and, uh, and that we should say that, of course, many people, including many people in our audience who are concerned about global warming, have the best of intentions and have nothing to do with funneling funds to different places. Yeah, well, in terms of that question, it's Tom Steyer is one of the biggest Democratic donors, and he actually ran for president. And interestingly, this was back in 2019. He laid out almost pre-COVID lockdown almost this vision of using emergency powers. He actually said in 2019, this was like February 2019, one of the I think the number one largest Democratic donor, maybe by individual. I will declare a climate emergency as president. And I will be able I will be able to determine about industry, automobiles, energy. He literally laid out in like a shouting and an angry vision of him as a dictator under emergency powers. That message trickled down to Democrats. That's why Joe Biden is now considering. And, and these are this is again this is where the big money from Democrats comes from. So that's one of the reasons that all these politicians who would normally go along with it. In fact, Joe Manchin. I don't know if he personally benefited. I haven't heard that. But for the Inflation Reduction Act, it was the usual pork barrel spending and the strong arming that they pushed into that uh, to make well, that the happen. The second answer to that is that, um, I'll just say it very simply, Mitch McConnell's wife, who's Chinese, 
is worth a fortune in China. And I'm sure that is relevant to him. And Joe Biden, we've all gone through. We're not supposed to talk about it anymore. But see, that's part also, the, the left demonizes truth and, well, and I insists, should... upon, insists upon a narrative that is their narrative only. So if you want to say, uh, you know, there's election fraud, well, no state is decertified. So in terms of the, the whole mechanics of lawfare, you can't say that election was fraudulent because you don't have proof. The idea that uh, the Department of Justice is there now pursuing a political agenda, the idea of democracy of this globalist crowd would be an EU parliament where no one is really elected by the people. They're selected. Yeah. And so therefore, the money that comes in is no longer coming from traditional sources, winning votes and getting people to back your That's campaign. Your I have to say that uh, Secretary Chow's family uh, fled China. I know. I and, apologize. Uh, for any... She came to the United States at the age of nine, not being able to speak any English, and then rose to become uh, the Secretary of Labor, the Secretary of I Transportation. I was and proud to you, work for you her. Work for in her both yes. the... And I'm not. I'm not suggesting yeah, that there's she, corruption. Yeah. But no, the family she... is worth millions in China. And uh, it's it. It's a wonderful. It's a wonderful American success story. And, uh, Mitch McConnell is an excellent Elaine. politician. I would never disparage him. Question over here. Uh, we have. Uh, you could identify yourself. Uh, Frederick Peterson, and uh, I wanted to first uh, address a comment. We're we're looking at. I know the term has been grossly overused lately, but existential threats to our system to personal liberty and to the economy uh, worldwide. There is a great upheaval given the powers that are, the powers that of technology and control that exist now that are also unprecedented in the history of the world. This is critical. Back at Seton Hall Law School, a little personal note, uh, we founded something called the Environmental Law Forum. Sir, uh, sir, do you have a question? Do you have a question? Yes, What's I your do. Question? I, I, yes, I do. Uh, let me finish. I'm getting right to it. The Environmental Law Forum, or ELF, Little Elf, uh, was also a survival technique. And I offer this for all of us. ELF stood for, for those in the inner circle, eat the liberals first. <laughs> Um, sir, sir, if you At any have rate, a question, the question we'll is, front, yeah. the question is, uh, we are facing within a matter of days a national election that may well turn the history of the world or at least give it a chance to survive. Do you have any estimate as to whether the, the forces against a raid against American liberty and freedom are going to be able to survive this election? Or what do you think if they realize they are about to be unsettled and people are waking up, will the election actually be suspended as was, uh, as is possible? Okay, and thank you very uh, much. dictatorial uh, powers yeah, be yeah. Thanks very uh, much. Uh, yeah. Mark and then Jerry? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think they'll. I mean, I think two years ago there was worry with the COVID and we can't have in person voting and we may have to delay. I don't think there's anything like that in terms of uh, COVID going along. I do think that they're very worried, Democrats, and that's why the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, they're doing anything they can to keep energy under control until that election. They're very afraid. Uh, I just hope that if the Republicans do win, that the Republican leadership capitalizes on this. I wish the Republicans, instead of having their not contract with America, what was it called, commitment to America, they had done something simple like, you know, we will stand up for free speech, we will stand up for gas, we will not allow gas-powered car bans without a vote, we won't allow, you know, food banning of meat, we won't allow um, energy blackouts where we went America. I wish they had done something that was a little bit more, less wonkish and more relevant to people's lives that people watch the news and worry about. But we'll see. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't think there'll be any uh, 
I don't know. I don't know. I can't make a prediction on this. It's going to be very. Well, we have a unknown. we have a hard stop, so we have one time for one more okay. question. So let's go to this gentleman here. I would like here. to say, oh. these powers, the, these groups that get power, Russian Revolution was carried out by a small group, Mao's Revolution by a small group. These groups are very reluctant to let go of power once they get it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Question. Uh, Bill Walters, could you comment on the degree to which Russian and Chinese propagandists use American social media to accomplish these purposes that that you were asking about? That's a well, great question. Yeah, Let's I was have just a quick say, answer from each well, of you. Uh, quickly, I wish we would apply environment, social governance, ESG standards to products from China. That would end the whole solar and uh, ba electric battery. Imagine if we actually were able to do that. Uh, in don't terms pay of a lot China, more Russia, many, uh, we don't we'd all pay a lot more in the stores if that were true. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you would, but I'm just saying that would be uh, if you're going to apply it to a U.S. companies, it should be evenly equally applied. It's not. Uh, and in terms of uh, China, Russia, Kevin Mooney actually with the Heritage Foundation and others has done great reports about Chinese. I'm sorry, not Chinese, but Russian uh, and. Russian money, particularly going into environmental groups to promote, you know, shutting down U.S. energy. So it's one of the things. Jeremy. My quick answer is the uh, control of the messaging, the propaganda, and the control of the dialogue, the narrative, is fundamental to this postmodernist world that is at the heart, the Frankfurt School, etc., at the heart of this woke movement. Marcuse's book, Repressive Tolerance. They do not want to tolerate anyone else's views. So, you, and the answer to your question is essentially yes, that I think China does influence the social media, but it's remarkable how much our government is, in a sense, influenced by China, and for some reason has decided to uh, apply NATO to Russia, which does not seem to be a good strategy at the moment as far as Mr. Putin's concerned. Not that I'm a Putin lover, but he uh, is a very effective protector of Russian sovereignty and will continue to want access to the Atlantic and the, through both Finland and Ukraine, as Russia's wanted to do for hundreds of years. Point is, we have got a dialogue that is, in a sense, the model of China, and the left here agrees with the cultural Maoism that is at the heart of China and at the heart of the woke movement. Gramsci, March Through Institutions, that's what's being done. Well, with that, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our online audience for listening. And we hope this will be the start of many other similar discussions. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Appreciate it.